So, Dr. Wanikoko, thank you so much for uh, finding the time to talk to us. We're, I'm Paul Goldberg. I'm the editor and publisher of The Cancer Letter. There is here Amy Lacey, who is representing Rob Wen at VCU. Uh, and uh, here's uh, also Otis Brawley, who is representing the truth and the American people and peace and justice and so forth. So uh, I guess, again, my first question isn't really a question. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased and honored to be part of this conversation. And uh, uh, what a great time to meet during this important month of February, you know, the Black History Month. So it has a lot of, um, you know, importance for all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I guess one question that sort of comes to mind as I look at your career is you could have really landed almost anywhere. You're you're from Nigeria. Uh, you have a degree, PhD from Dusseldorf. Uh, what brought you to the United States? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, growing up in Nigeria, uh, I did my medical school there uh, from a large family, five siblings, my dad, businessman, politician, and uh, he's always encouraged all his kids to just go for it. You know, I remember growing up, if you go to my dad and you say something is not going to happen or if it's impossible or it's impossible, you will look at it and say, in Nigeria with connection, you can see God. <laughs> so that has always been the motivation for all of us in my family. And uh, so I, I was lucky and fortunate enough I started my postgraduate training actually as a pathologist in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And as part of our system there, your last year of pathology training or fellowship training, you're allowed to go anywhere to spend that time abroad. So I ended up in Germany spending uh, two and a half years there, uh, during which time I participated in the doctoral program and um, I did my doctorate in pathology, finished my training. And it so happened that while I was at that institution at the University of Dusseldorf, one of the former professors there relocated to the US, but still had a family in Dusseldorf. Uh, so he used to come back to the university and was you know, trying to recruit people to come and join his lab here. And um, long story short, I applied for that position and I got in as a postdoc in his lab at Hopkins. So I actually landed in Baltimore uh, August 29, 2000. Uh, that was my uh, initial introduction to the U.S. And, you know, I've always been fascinated by research, but also by clinical care. And, you know, I decided to do pathology training just because of the, the breadth of knowledge in pathology. And I would have remained in that field coming to the U.S., but I realized that if I had to go back into clinical practice as a pathologist, I had to retrain again you know, spending five years or more in order to be certified as a, uh, a licensed pathologist in the U.S. So that's why I decided rather than spend another five years relearning pathology, I would rather learn something new, but hopefully something that would take maximum advantage of my background as a pathologist. So that was actually the reason why from the time I enrolled in internal medicine residency training, I knew I was going to do medical oncology. And, uh, you know, long story short, that is how I ended up in, in oncology. Mm -hmm. I know that your career took you to my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for a while, yeah. and now you're in Maryland. How did you, how did you end up in Maryland? What was that process like? Like people say, you know, the first city you live in the U.S. as a first generation immigrant is almost always where you end up being. And I, Initially, I didn't believe that, but lo and behold, 20 years later, I'm back in Baltimore where I started. So maybe that, that is actually true uh, for a lot of first generation immigrants that you have that particular attachment to the first city you land in. Uh, but my foray into Pittsburgh actually came about because of my interest in drug development. When I was in residency training, my mentor then, Alan Haber, who is a pulmonologist, uh, wanted me to be a, an intensivist. And I told Alan, I said, you know what? I enjoy pulmonary medicine, but the ICU part, I don't see myself doing that for the rest of my life. I just don't have the, 
you know, the patients to be attentive to what you need on a day by day basis. In the, I, I can do it for a month. I'm disciplined myself, but not for my entire career. But I said, Alan, one thing I promise you is I'm going to do thoracic oncology. That's actually how I ended up being a thoracic oncologist because of that, my mentor. Uh, that I told, I'm not going to do pulmonary critical care, but I'll do thoracic oncology. So it happened that when I interviewed for a fellowship program uh, position in Pittsburgh, I met Chandra Bellani, who happened to be a thoracic oncologist, and somebody who has been very, very, who was very, very critical to my academic pursuit uh, is the late Mary Legorin. You know, he just moved to Pittsburgh then, is a clinical pharmacologist, and he was in drug development, and, you know, I met with him and I just knew that that was an environment I want to go into for training. So that was how I ended up in Pittsburgh for my fellowship training. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I have uh, a lot in common, including Meryl Lagoran, who gave yeah. me a lot of opportunities as yeah. well, including, you know, his brother is the mm -hmm. guy who owns Ted Med. Yeah. But uh, you've come to the University of Maryland now. Yeah. And uh, by the way, congratulations. It's been said that cardinals are princes of the Catholic Church and NCI designated cancer center directors are princes of oncology. So <laughs> as oncology royalty, uh, your cancer center, what do you see? Every cancer center is really good at something. What is your cancer center really good at? So looking at University of Maryland, two things were particularly attractive to me. And Otis, you know this, when I was at Emory, one of the areas of interest for me has always been how the cancer center, you know, interacts with the community that they serve. And particularly with my own background and interest in disparity, of course, not at the same level as where Otis is, but I've always had a toe in that, in that space. I believe that University of Maryland is uniquely positioned uh, because of the trust that they've gained with the community that they serve, very diverse population, not just African-Americans, but also Hispanic population in this uh, state. I believe that they are uniquely positioned to help us advance the science of cancer health disparity. And that I think positions the cancer center to be a key player within the community of cancer centers, because not every cancer center is positioned to do that, number one, in terms of leadership interest, but secondly, in terms of having the population and the community trust for you to be able to engage with them and do things together that would then help advance the, you know, the health of the community as a whole, but not just in the state of Maryland. I believe that if we do a good job, the lessons that we learn here you know, interacting, partnering with the community will be lessons that can then be shared across the, the entire country and even the world of how do you go about, you know, everybody, Otis always says, you know, anytime you talk about disparity, the first thing Otis will ask you is take away access. And then you see most of your disparity will disappear. And I believe that that is to a large extent accurate, but I also do believe that we don't know what we don't know. Uh, is it possible that when we take away the, uh, inequity in terms of access to care, that there could also be other things that are driving the disparate outcomes that we see in different communities. It may not be biologically relevant, but it may not all be explained by just limitations in terms of access to care. So I believe that Maryland is uniquely positioned to be able to drive the conversation in that space. And that was one of the attractions for me, looking from outside. Now that I'm inside the system, I'm even more encouraged to do that because um, listening to the leaders, which is what I've been doing for the past one month, you know, meeting all the different stakeholders, members of the cancer community, uh, other schools within the system, the president, the deans, I can see that people genuinely believe that they are called out to this, to serve the community. And that is not something that you perceive at other cancer, at least all the places I've been, to, I've been at, including Emory, which as Otis knows very well, very engaged, maybe not as engaged with the community as Maryland is, but you can perceive that as something that the leadership truly believes in and that they want to support, they want to drive. And I'm very, very happy and honored to be part of that process. I'm hopeful that, you know, uh, this next phase of the growth of the Cancer Center will actually see us 
do things that will be very, very impactful in the community. I'll be, I say, like a demonstration project of how do you do this and how do you do it well that other people can then learn and then adopt at their own cancer center. The second thing that I think differentiates the uh, University of Maryland Greener Bank Cancer Center is actually the pipeline. How do you train the next generation of oncologists and scientists? Um, you know, every cancer center has, you know, their training program, but to actually have an organically, you know, built program that starts from middle school uh, all the way to graduate level. And this is not just a one-off thing. You know, uh, we're going through some of the accomplishment of our cure program and the SOTEC, and we're looking at students middle schoolers who came into that program and were followed all the way through high school. And now we are thinking of how do we support them when they go to college? That we don't want to just say, okay, our job is done. We got into college. Bye-bye. Let's wash our hands up. That even if you don't say in our community, the leader of our program came to you and said, Taufik, I really want to create another program that will help these kids succeed. Now that they've gone into college, regardless of where they are, can we have a platform that will continue to support them and make sure that they are successful? So that I think is the other thing that is uniquely uh, uh, uni uh, 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 impactful with the Greener Bank Cancer Center. And I want to see that continue to grow and help you know, build that pipeline of people from all walks of life, different backgrounds, but especially looking at those who have not had the opportunity, uh, whether by reason of place of birth, where they've lived, their parental support, and the social infrastructure that they grew in uh, to help them be able to access those opportunities and make something really impactful with their, with their lives and their career. How else can, is, so you're saying that to, to, to get or for the physician's workforce to become more diverse, you need to start early. Has this, how do we know when we're starting at the right time. And what else can be done? Can this process, progress be accelerated? I think you have to make haste slowly. Um, you can accelerate the process, not by, I think there are different strategies by which you can do that. Number one, we have to grow the pipeline. Uh, secondly, is you have to have the buy-in from multiple stakeholders. You know, our cure program right now, we've had close to 68 such middle schoolers going through that process. We now have about 16 to 18 pupils coming into that program on a yearly basis. And when you look at that, that is just one institution. Uh, like I said, if we do it well and we show that you can be successful at it and other institutions can also adopt the same strategy, that will be one way for you to accelerate the process. It will not be for us to say, you know, Maryland will just go 10 times to what we are doing now. That is also not uh, practical and it's not viable. But if we have 10 additional cancer centers doing it at the same level as Maryland is doing it, all of a sudden that pipeline is much bigger and the chances of those, uh, you know, kids eventually becoming successful uh, oncology-based scientists, physicians will, you know, uh, increase exponentially. Diversity and leadership too, you know, it's it's an ongoing conversation and so important. And um, Dr. Wynn sends his regrets for not being able to join today, but uh, he wanted me to welcome you to the club. So welcome. Thank you. But when he joined VCU Massey Comprehensive Cancer Center in December of 2019, at the mm -hmm. time he was the only African-American mm -hmm. um, who was the director of a cancer center. And now now there are five, uh, yeah. just a few years later of an NCI designated center. Yeah. Um, what would you like to do with your role? And uh, I'm sure it's not lost on you that, you know, you are part of the change in oncology mm. yeah. and um, making history in your own way. Well, you know, it's humbling for, for me to be talked about in the same realm as all these other people you've talked about, you know, for me to be mentioned in the same breath as, as, as them is quite humbling. And when you think about the Black History Month, which we're now celebrating, I was actually reflecting on that. And I remember what someone said about, you know, intelligence and capabilities randomly distributed across all communities. What is not random is access to opportunities. 
And you know, as we all reflect on this Black History Month and what this means uh, for the segment of our society, uh, but it's not just the Black community alone. You can look at different segments of the, of, the, of the society. There's always going to be something that you look at and say, well, why is this group not so well represented in what is going on? And that takes a lot of, number one, recognition that there's a problem. Uh, second is to have a strategy to address those problems. And the third is for those who have had the opportunity and the good fortune uh, to be able to have a platform to contribute to that history, to not just think that they have done it and that is where it ends. You don't climb that and then you know, pull it up behind you. You have to then create an opportunity for so many others to come behind you. I, I look forward to the time in this country where we do not have to celebrate Black History Month because every day will be a day where you have a lot to celebrate by Black person or people of any other background in this country. That to me is when I would say we've actually truly succeeded, but we have to start from somewhere. At least now celebrating what we've done, uh, what we accomplished, those ahead of us, what they've accomplished and we are trying to build on, uh, I think is almost like passing the torch. Now they've given it to us, what can we do about it? Uh, the, the meaning and the importance is not lost on me to say, this is not a random opportunity that you just get. And when you have it, what do you want to do with it? So back to your question is, what do you want to do with it? You know, my number one is I want to make sure that however long I stay in this position for, I want to look back and say, how many more people like me, you know, did I use this opportunity to help advance their own career? And how many more who are not like me also are able to advance their career because we have the opportunity to interact? So to me, Pipeline building, mentoring is one key thing that's very, very valuable. It's one place that you can never go wrong because if you train people to be better than you, that is the only way you're going to be successful. It's not about you being successful and everything stopping with you. It's more about growing people who are going to be better than you and will come after you and then continue to carry that touch forward. Can I ask you, what are, your, what are the programs at the University of Maryland Greenbaum Cancer Center? What are the research programs? So we currently have uh, five research programs. And as you know, uh, every cancer center has something on therapeutics. So we have the experimental therapeutics program. Of course, we have population science. We have um, a program that we call MSB. We have the immunotherapy program which is separate from my experimental therapeutics. And then we have the hormone related cancer program. And the HRC is actually something that reflects the history of Greener Bam Cancer Center. Uh, aromatase inhibitor was discovered and developed at this cancer center. And we pride ourselves in that accomplishment, but we do not want to stop there. Uh, we actually now have a lot of investigators trying to develop the next generation of you know, um, aromatase type uh, inhibitors, AR antagonists, uh, but other aspects of the cancer center also looking at newer ways of treating cancer. We're very, very strong when it comes to cell therapy and uh, immunotherapy. That's an area that I want to see us continue to grow. And um, sickle cell disease, why that is not cancer, it's actually part of our cancer program, not a research program for us, but part of our clinical program. Uh, where we take care of patients with sickle cell and thalassemia, and we are the uh, one of the leading sites in the country uh, when it comes to cell therapy approaches, experimental cell therapy approaches, and hopefully very soon, standard of care approaches for gene therapy and cell therapy for uh, patients with sickle cell and uh, thalassemia. For people who don't know, Dr. Angela Brody yeah. was one of the early, early women in oncology, and she worked out a great deal of the biochemistry that we now know about in terms of aromatase inhibitors and some of the early, uh, I'm sorry, aromatase and that whole group, that whole spectrum, and then some of the aromatase inhibitors. And she's really one of the unsung heroes of oncology, and she was at the University of Maryland before it was an NCI-designated cancer center. Um, uh, Otis and I are uh, 
co-editors of, of the Cancer History Project. And yes. over the past uh, five years, really, um, it's been great to see one of the disparities uh, in the number of directors of cancer centers or blood go away, uh, or certainly get much, much, much better. Um, now, the question I've been asking is, why uh, why is why has there not why has the number of women uh, who are really not a minority, they're a majority, been decreasing the absolute number of women uh, in uh, directors running cancer centers. And this is with uh, the pipelines being just fine, thank you very much. Medical schools have produced women physicians for yeah. a very long time now. What do you think is going on? What, what do you think is happening and how can uh, it get better? Yeah. You know, I, I think just like when we talk about underrepresented in medicine groups, um, you know, I made a comment about opportunities not being randomly distributed. Uh, challenges are also not randomly distributed. That, you know, there are unique challenges that our female colleagues uh, face. And you, know, you may not appreciate that if you've not had the opportunity to actually look at it. And I remember when I was in Pittsburgh as the chief of HEMA, uh, one of my vice chiefs, um, Annie Aim, a very, very engaged, passionate leader about women issues. She will come here and say, Topic, you're not getting what I'm saying. You know, I'm a woman, I'm a mother. There are things that just will not work for me uh, the way you want to do it. And I said, Tell me, how do you want us to do it? I'm, I'm all ears. I want to learn because I don't want to assume that I have the broad perspective of what it means to be a female leader, a female scientist, a female clinician. Uh, so if I just assume that I know everything that needs to be, you know, thought about to take care of in order for people to succeed, I will be failing our female colleagues. So I think we first need to address, recognize the problem that despite all the statistics that we've seen, you know, more women graduating from medical school, more women, you know, going into uh, you know, graduate studies and things like that. Why is it at the top end of that pyramid, you do not have fair representation of uh, women and other gender uh, classes within the leadership of cancer centers? I think that I, I cannot tell you that I have all the answers, but I do feel that if we recognize as a problem and then number one, listen to people who are in the mid stage of their career, they're evolving and getting into those leadership roles to say, what are the unique challenges that you have faced that you think is really limiting your ability to do this or wanting to do it? It's not actually not having the ability. I think part of it is wanting to take on those roles. What can we do to make it more, uh, not necessarily attractive, but for people to, like, to feel like this is something that they want to devote their time to? What are the other challenges that you face that maybe a man would not even recognize unless you lay it out for them? And then coming down with um, real strategies to address those, maybe unique support system, unique approaches to how you run the cancer center, what do you need the cancer center director to be? What type of leadership team do you have to put in place? And finally is when you do the search for the directors to be very intentional because if you start with a pool with very limited number of women to start with, it's very, very likely just by a random distribution that you end up with a non-female candidate taking that position. So maybe you also have to reflect on the way the search processes are structured, who are the members of those, and how do you go about being intentional in broadening that starting pool of candidates before you now start winnowing it down until you get to the uh, eventual director to be selected. So just like you do for you know, ethnic and racial minority, I think you have to have a strategy to address a population like that to say, how come we don't have as many female leaders leading our cancer centers across the country? And what, what are we missing in terms of how we actually select those leaders? Mm -hmm. and thank you. You obviously talked about disparity and access as being barriers, challenges that um, are being faced in oncology right now. 
Um, what are some of the other areas uh, that you really feel that we all need to be working on um, that we can truly, truly move the needle in the next few years? So what do we need to work on in terms of moving the needle for cancer outcome overall? So I think the good news is, at least looking at the data, and we take that for what it means, data is data, but you know, each patient is as important as the next patient. Uh, but we know that overall, cancer-related mortality is dropping, um, a reflection of a lot of the advances that we've made in the last 10, 20 years, uh, targeted therapy option, immunotherapy option. <clears throat> I think if you look at where we're going to have massive gains, at least in my own um, uh, estimation, is a lot of the low-hanging fruits when it comes to therapeutic intervention for advanced stage cancer, I think we've probably plugged those fruits. Uh, we're not going to have another anti-PD-1 therapy that would you know, be so uh, impactful across multiple tumor types, maybe not in the next five to 10 years, and maybe, uh, maybe just being not as enthusiastic that something like that would happen. I hope it does. I do feel that one area that we've all neglected is early detection and prevention. And I feel that that is probably where we have to focus on in terms of the next big win when it comes to uh, you know, moving the needle. Uh, you know, that's an area where I know Otis is very, very passionate about. You, know, uh, you have to be careful about how you position that in front of others. <laughs> uh, but if you just look at the lung cancer space, where I work, you know, I always tell people yeah. when you look at lung cancer screening and the impact versus the impact of the best drug that we have now, it's like night and day. Yeah. Yeah. Simple intervention, cost-effective intervention, but very, very big impact. Now, not to diminish the role of targeted therapy and immunotherapy, but it's not comparable. But I do believe that that is probably where the next big win in cancer will come from. And it may just be that we have to adapt some of our effective strategies now of targeted and immunotherapy to the early stages of cancer to sort of you know, change that uh, 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 paradigm. You know, uh, this is a longer conversation later. <laughs> this is something we need to get an answer later. You know, my favorite, my favorite country right now is Costa Rica. Mm. You know why? They have a greater life expectancy than in the United States by several years and a much lower cancer death rate and no screening programs. Mm. Okay, there you go. <laughs> it's all risk reduction, yeah. or you might call it prevention. Mm -hmm. It's all risk reduction. Yeah, they do it again without screening program. Mm. But hey, but let's get back. What in your mind? There's sixty some odd NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers. What is your definition of what an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center ought to be doing? You know, that is that is a loaded question. <laughs> and you know, I'm not surprised coming from what is has been on EABs for many cancer centers. And I was last week I was visiting Lombardy just to learn from uh the leadership team there to say, you know, how can we work together? What has worked well for you that we can learn from? And, you know, the conversation drifted to, you know, right now the NCI wants you to justify why you need to exist. You know, why do you as a cancer center, as opposed to the others, you know, 75 other cancer centers, what is the reason for your being? And I think each cancer center will have to define that for themselves, uh, both in terms of number one, the population that they serve, and secondly, in terms of the, the wider um, community of uh, oncology of what do you want to contribute to the overall conversation of cancer? And you have to then define for yourself, where is your strength? What do you bring to the table? And how do you want to use that strength to impact your local community, but eventually uh, the, the larger community of uh, uh, oncology scientists clinicians, as well as primarily our patient. So when you look at Greenerbaum, what does Greenerbaum want to be known for to differentiate us from other cancer centers, like I said in the beginning, is really our trust 
and our, you know, very, 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 very strong relationship with the community. What can we do, not just in our labs, but what can we do in partnership with the people in the community uh, that will help us, number one, identify what is important to them, and then bring that back into the cancer center and then use our expertise to refine the question and then try to come up with solutions for it. And I think every cancer center will have to, you know, come at that question differently based on what they want to do, what they think they're good at, and what is going to differentiate them from other cancer centers. Yeah, I'll pick I'll pick this up. Uh, how how many investigators do you have in your cancer center? Approximately. So approximately we have about two hundred and uh, thirty three members. Uh, who are cancer center affiliates uh, across different departments for the uh, University of Maryland system. Yeah, that's actually an important point. And as you go into the community, are you putting people in, you know, uh, Prince George's County mm -hmm. and other counties into yeah. the cancer center? Yes, we do. Uh, so we have members across the different campuses of University of Maryland. Um, for instance, one of my associate director, for instance, is actually based at College Park, uh, but she's very, very well integrated into our system. We meet on a regular basis. She visits campus here. We have a lot of activities in the community that she leads, even though our office is not here in downtown Baltimore, but uh, over at College Park, yes. For people who may not know, your, the University of Maryland Medical Center is in downtown Baltimore. Yeah but you service, what's your catchment area? So we, uh, our catchment is about 13 counties, uh, mostly in central Maryland and uh, south, southern Maryland. Uh, but we see the entire state as a catchment area. But for the purposes of the, of the P30 grant, we focus on those 13 contiguous counties around Baltimore City and Baltimore County. Where's, uh, what is the area where incidence is highest? The cancer problems in Maryland are highest in central Maryland where Baltimore is, mm -hmm. and then in far eastern Maryland, the eastern shore, and yeah. far western Maryland, and much of far western Maryland west of Frederick is actually Appalachia. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with poor whites yeah. in the far west more mm. whites in the far east nice. and blacks in the central area yeah. and uh, that areas like montgomery county and prince george's county mm. have much lower cancer rates mm. and yeah. they have much lower smoking rates as uh, a famous yeah. cancer center director is famous for saying the only people who smoke in montgomery county are on the washington beltway driving through the county <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm also I'm beginning to learn the states. Uh, you know, it's just my first month here. So i I think we covered a lot. Is there anything we forgot to ask? Um, I think you know the other thing that we probably didn't talk about is, but maybe all these ask that indirectly, which is, why do you have to be here? You know, if you have sixty one other cancer centers or, you know, uh, fifty six comprehensive. NCI designated cancer centers. I think the one area that I also want to pay attention to is looking at University of Maryland. We have many schools in the health sciences space, you know, School of Pharmacy, School of Dentistry, School of Nursing, School of Social Work. And I'm very hopeful that going forward, we are going to, you know, harness the expertise and the resources within those schools to also elevate what we do within the Greenerbaum Cancer Center. In addition to that, uh, we are opportunity to be located here in Baltimore, where we're just a few miles away from Hopkins. That is good and bad, but I see it more as good than bad, uh, because it then allows you to be able to partner, to collaborate, and you know, use economy of scale. You know, to achieve things that maybe ordinarily we won't be able to accomplish on our own or unique strength that we bring that will complement what Hopkins is able to do. And if you drive just 30 miles uh, further south, you have the Georgetown Lombardi Cancer Center. Uh, when I was there, we were talking about, you know, when you look at our size relative to places like MD Anderson, Hopkins Memorial or Dana-Farber, 
the scale is just not there for you to be able to do certain things. But maybe if you look regionally, geographically to say, okay, Maryland is there, Lombard is there, BC is there, not too far off. Are there things that we can do together as mid-sized cancer centers that will further help us you know, leverage our unique capabilities and expertise and then maybe bring it close to what you see with all the other gigantic uh, cancer centers uh, around the country? Oh, that's a fascinating. Uh, I would we agree with you. Uh, I, I look forward to working with you as well. You know, cancer is the enemy, not the cancer center down the street. All right. That's what Dr. Wen always says, you know, we truly are one team in this one fight against cancer. Mm -hmm. And when we can work together and maximize our resources and yeah. share our science, and that's that's when breakthroughs happen. And, and that's yeah. when we truly make a difference. Exactly. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, we'll continue to do everything we do and we try not to do any harm. That's right, that's right. <laughs> 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 Amy, he's taking off on the fact that Paul and I wrote a book. Oh, uh, actually. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. 